This week on the CNET Tech Review, Microsoft moves Office into the cloud, Twitter made easy in a handy how-to, Vizio turns a tablet into a TV remote, and the Samsung Trender is behind the times. It's all coming up right now. Hi everyone, I'm Brian Tong and welcome to the CNET Tech Review where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech and offer some unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's start off with the good. Given the popularity of Google Docs and the growth of cloud computing in general, it was only a matter of time before Microsoft got in the game. This week, the folks behind Outlook, Excel, and Word launched Office 365, the online version of their business productivity suite. Here's Jason Parker to walk you through the new service. Office 365 is officially launched, bringing familiar web-based apps and Microsoft services to professionals and small businesses. But does it offer the tools that your business needs? I'm Jason Parker from CNET, and this is a first look at Microsoft Office 365. Office 365 combines familiar Microsoft Office web apps with web-enabled tools so businesses can email, create and share documents, hold online meetings, and much more. As a subscription service, Microsoft is offering a few tiered packages aimed at businesses of different sizes with varying productivity needs. Powered by Microsoft Exchange Online, businesses can now have access to email, calendars, and contacts from virtually anywhere on almost any device. The Microsoft Outlook web app has a similar look and feel to Outlook for desktops and can be connected with Office 2010 or Office 2007 so you have the same email inbox everywhere. Microsoft also includes its forefront online protection for Exchange which scans continually for viruses and spam to keep your business secure. Along with email, you'll be able to share calendars and quickly schedule meetings with access to your colleagues' availability. Simply go to the calendar app, view your coworker's calendar, then set up a meeting time. Now your calendar will show the meeting on whatever device you log in with. When it's time to create documents, Microsoft Office web apps act as a companion to the desktop versions of Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote, powered by Microsoft SharePoint. Though you won't have the laundry list of options found in the desktop versions, the web apps offer enough features to create and edit documents while keeping the same formatting on your desktop and on the web. You can write and make style decisions in a document in Word, edit spreadsheets in Excel, create or edit a PowerPoint presentation while away from the office, and collaborate and share notebooks in OneNote. Office 365 keeps your organization's work in one place by letting you create a team website. Here you'll be able to keep shared documents for collaboration, post messages for employees, or create new team sites for specific projects. Even with access to Office 365 from anywhere, sometimes you need to contact someone directly, even if it's over the web. Powered by Microsoft Link Online, you can have a quick chat over a secure IM client hold online meetings with audio and video, or share your desktop to show an employee exactly what you mean. Even people outside of your company can be given access, so you can meet up with clients online. When you're ready to share your wares with the world, you can use Office 365 to create and maintain a public-facing website. The service gives you several layouts, and you can pick from hundreds of themes to match your type of business. You can make further changes to style and text for even more site variations. You can also add custom CSS code if you want to create a style sheet of your own. Office 365 for small businesses under 25 employees costs $6 per user per month. Larger businesses can choose from four enterprise plans for anywhere from $10 per user to $27 per user per month for more options and advanced tools. Overall, Office 365 is a solid solution for collaboration and access anywhere tools for businesses. With familiar web apps, access from almost any device, and tools to produce team sites and a public-facing website, Office 365 just might be the solution your business needs. I'm Jason Parker for CNET, and this has been a first look for Office 365. Thanks for watching. Now, while Office 365 aims to help small business employees collaborate more efficiently online, Apple's iCloud service aims to help all of your personal iDevices work together more easily. In this week's Top 5, Brian Cooley, my main man, is counting down the reasons why iCloud gets it right.
Apple's iCloud. I bet you're intrigued by it, even if you don't really understand it. I'm Brian Cooley with the top five reasons that Apple's iCloud rocks. Number five, backup. Eh, don't yawn. I know it's kind of a sleeper, but with iCloud, an iOS device can back itself up to Apple's cloud servers once a day when it finds Wi-Fi. That means photos, settings, apps, app data, all that fiddly stuff. And not only is it backed up that way, you can restore all that to a new iOS device you buy easily and wirelessly as well. That's pretty slick. Number four, all your music, even the stuff you stole. Apple's tight with the record label, so it was kind of a surprise that the new iTunes Match component of iCloud will recognize and sync all your music to all your devices, even your pirated music. Sure, you pay 25 bucks a year for that part, but that's a lot cheaper than dealing with the lawyers they could have sent. Number three, hiding the sausage. Uh, no, I mean, you don't see sausage being made in iCloud. Now, a certain faction of people think iCloud should have been more literal and folder-based, with you being able to get your hands dirty, dragging and dropping stuff across directories and network shares. Apple decided no, and they're probably dead right. Most of their consumers have lives and don't want to administer a server. Number two, just do it. iCloud is largely a synchronizing service that happens to use the cloud to make that work. That means a high degree of automatic background just do itness that you won't find in, say, Amazon Cloud Drive or Google Music. If it works right, Tylenol sales and a certain amount of harsh obscenities should plummet. And the number one reason I bet you find iCloud at least a little bit irresistible is the freeness. The heart of MobileMe, contacts, calendar, email that used to be 99 bucks a year is now part of iCloud for the approximate cost of Nothing. Free. $99 off. 100% discount. You get it. Google hates this part, but you're going to love it. Now, for more top fives like this, including next week's top five things that are wrong with iCloud, head to top5.cnet.com. I'm Brian Cooley. Thanks for watching. And be sure to come back next week for Cooley's top five features that could make iCloud even better. Yes, there's always room for improvement. Now, there are over 300 million Twitter users in the world today, but are you one of them? If not, what are you waiting for? Maybe once Sharon Vaknin explains how easy it is to get started, you'll change your mind. Hey, everyone. I'm Sharon Vaknin for CNET.com with your guide to getting started on Twitter. Now, this is Twitter 101, so we'll go over the basics like setting up your account, Twitter lingo like RT and pound signs, and finally, I'll give you a basic strategy for tweeting. On Facebook and Twitter, I asked you guys to give me your best tips, so I'll include those too. And I should also mention that there are a ton of Twitter apps for your desktop or your mobile devices, but I'm just going to focus on what Twitter does, and you can decide which app to use after we cover the basics. Okay, so let's get started at Twitter.com. First, pick a username, which should be short and sweet. Refrain from picking weird handles like DogLoverXO. We just don't do that on Twitter. Now edit your profile. There are only a few things to do here, so it's important to get it right. Upload a profile picture. And add a bio. As Ashley Laurel explains, your bio should include who you are, where you're from, and what you're interested in. It'll help people decide if they should follow you or not. Good. Now that you've got your profile set up, let's talk about tweeting. This is where you tweet, and below this is your timeline where you see updates from people you follow. For tweets, you're limited to 140 characters or less, which you probably know, but there is some Twitter lingo you need to learn. If you want to tag someone in a tweet, use the at symbol followed by their username. Your tweet will show up in their mentions tab, and anytime someone tags you, you'll see it in your mentions tab. So if I want to say something to Eric Franklin or Neatopal on Twitter, I'd write at Neatopal, then the message. This tweet will only show up in Eric's mentions and the timeline of anyone who follows Eric and I. But if I tweet something and include at Neatopal somewhere in the middle, it'll show up in the timeline of everyone who follows me. At replies or mentions are public, so if you want something a little more private, send a direct message. You can send a message to anyone who follows you. Just go to the Messages tab and send one here. Now let's talk about retweets. If you see something interesting from someone on your timeline, you might want to repost it to your followers. Just click Retweet under the tweet you want to repost, and it'll show up in the timeline. 
Or you can copy the tweet and preface it with RT, then the person's Twitter handle, and that way it'll show up in that person's mentions tab. But now that you know how to communicate on Twitter, you might be wondering what the heck you should tweet about. Unless you're Kim Kardashian or Charlie Sheen, you're not going to get a million followers instantly. Be patient and use my tips to build your following. As Simon Everard points out, please, please, please don't talk about what you had for breakfast. Instead, find a niche and tweet about things that you're interested in or good at. Like if you decided that your niche is gaming, post links to articles you found, new games you're playing, and retweet other people in your gaming community. When you retweet, you're building relationships and getting the attention of other people like you, which is important for building a following. Talk to people or you'll get really lonely. Send them at replies and ask questions, comment on their tweets, and make conversation. If you're looking for people to follow, Twitter will give you suggestions over here on the front page. Like this person said, be active in other people's conversations and don't be discouraged if others are not active in yours. Another key Twitter trick is to use hashtags, which are like keywords for tweets. Just put the pound sign before any word. For example, I can tweet, I found this awesome recipe on chow.com, I can't wait to try it. Then you click that hashtag and see who else is talking about recipes. Sometimes hashtags become so popular that they end up in the trend section in the sidebar. It's a quick way to see what people are talking about. So those are the basics of using Twitter. But before I go, here's some advice from Joe Siegler. When starting new, try not to follow too many people too quickly. You can get overwhelmed. I've seen a few friends quit Twitter because of too much information. Thanks, Joe. Now, if you do get overwhelmed or just have any questions, feel free to ask me on Twitter or Facebook if it's more than 140 characters. And if you want to see more how-to videos, visit howto.cnet.com. For CNET, I'm Sharon Vaknin, and I'll see you on the interwebs. See, that's not so hard. Of course, once you do sign up, make sure you follow me, shameless plug, at Brian underscore Tongan. You know, don't forget to follow Mollywood, too. Now, though probably better known for their laptops and TVs, Toshiba and Vizio are just two of the latest companies to dive into the tablet deep end. Let's take a look at what these new models have to offer. I'm Scott Stein, Senior Editor at CNET.com, and this is a look at the Toshiba Thrive Tablet. Now, you're seeing a lot of Android honeycomb tablets around, but this one's a little bit different. What makes it different? Well, it's got a 10.1-inch screen. It's got Android Honeycomb 3.1, but it takes a few steps that make it a little bit more like a netbook in terms of its customizability. It's got a back cover that's replaceable, including a battery that's replaceable behind it. It's got an SD card slot that supports up to 128 gigs of extra memory. And Toshiba built in a file manager so you can actually browse pictures and music from it and be able to play them back so it expands the memory that's usually pretty limited on these tablets. Now the pricing's pretty aggressive, although the memory starts limited. 8 gigs for 429, 16 gigs for 479, or 32 gigs for 579. And it's available in mid-July. Also, what's really great is that despite its thickness, it also is able to work in a number of full ports that you don't see on tablets very often. HDMI, full USB, and a mini USB as well. Also, as you might expect from Toshiba, there are some built-in AV enhancements that are supposed to improve the quality of standard definition video, common to what we've seen on Toshiba laptops. I'm Scott Stein, and that's a quick look at the Toshiba Thrive tablet from the CEA Line Show in New York. I'm Scott Stein, senior editor at CNET.com, and this is a first look at the Vizio tablet at the CEA Line Show in New York. Now, you want to talk affordable, this Android gingerbread tablet is $349. Now, that does come with 4 gigs of memory, two of which are assigned to apps, two of which are user specified, but it does have a micro SD card slot for up to 32 gigs of add on memory. It also has an 8-inch screen, which is not something you normally see in a tablet. It affords a lot more space and has a 1024 by 768 resolution that also comes with stereo speakers that align vertically or horizontally, giving you a little more of a home theater feel in either orientation. Also, really interestingly, this acts as a remote. It actually is an IR blaster. That's the great part of it. And if you pair it with any variety of TVs, DVD players, receivers, what have you, it can recognize them and be used as a remote universally. Really, you don't have to use it with a Vizio TV or any other. And that's a really nice, it could be a great appeal for many people. In addition to IR and Bluetooth, this Vizio tablet also comes with video output and USB, courtesy of HDMI and USB outputs here. 
It's priced really kind of above the e-reader market, below what most people think of, and is an Android tablet price. Um, whether or not these internal storage will bother you depends on whether you're going to think that investing in those micro SD card slots could be worthwhile. And maybe you really think of it as more of kind of a, a super smart remote that you also can use as a tablet. There's a first look at the Vizio tablet that will be available starting in July. I'm Scott Stein, and this is the Vizio tablet at the CEA Line Show in New York. I could totally see the Vizio via, you know, propped up on my coffee table if I didn't already have this piece of junk. Now, while I see if I can find someone who wants a used iPad, let's take a break. But we've still got a lot more tech review right after this. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. Now continuing on in the good. With so many versions of Android phones out there, it can get pretty confusing if you're trying to decide which one to buy. But if you happen to be a T-Mobile customer, I'm about to make things a whole lot easier for you. What's up, Prize 5 fans? I'm Brian Tong, and this is a matchup between two 4 inch 4G touchscreen phones on T Mobile. It's a Prize 5 punch out between T Mobile's G2X and HTC's Sensation 4G. Our judges for this fight are senior editor Bonnie Boom Shakalaka Cha, senior editor Nicole It's So Cold Lee, and myself, Ring a Ling a Ding Tong. Now we'll take all three judges' blind scores and average them out to the nearest 10th each round. The final prize fight score will be an average of all rounds using the same decimal system. It's five rounds to the finish, so let's get it on. Round one is designed. T-Mobile's G2X has a solid design with a matte finish on the back. Its camera lens puts a little bump in its trunk, but this is a classy phone with a vibrant 4-inch 800 by 480 touchscreen display. HTC Sensation 4G ups the ante with a 4.3 inch QHD display that's even crisper with a 960 by 540 resolution, but not as bright. Now we all liked its contoured body, but its sweeping three-tone pattern on the back reminds me of a girl's skirt, but it doesn't hurt it here. The Sensation 4G takes the first round with a 4.7 and the G2X gets a solid four. Next round is controls and user interface. This round isn't easy when the T-Mobile's G2X brings a pure stock Android experience. There's no bells and whistles and it makes for a clean design. You'll still get widget customization and if you want more good news, it feels a tad bit snappier to use. Now HTC Sensation 4G brings the next generation of its user interface with an even sexier design. Yep, I just called an OS sexy. Now there's seven home screens and flashier animations across the board. The Sense UI has always been a favorite of ours and it just gets the edge with a perfect five and the G2X gets a 4.7. So after averaging two rounds, the Sensation 4G leads by half a point with plenty of fight left. Next round is features. Both of these phones are pretty evenly matched with dual core processors, eight megapixel cameras, Android's turn by turn maps and voice to text and HSPA plus compatibility, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Now you'll find everybody's favorite swipe keyboard technology on the G2X. It also comes preloaded with eight gigs of internal storage space and an additional micro SD card slot to add more storage. The main difference here is that it's currently running only Android 2.2 with a gingerbread update coming soon. Now HTC Sensation 4G is preloaded with gingerbread and you'll get some of the cool benefits like a much better cut, copy and paste, an application task killer or launching apps directly from the lock screen. It comes with its own flavor of swipe called Trace, but it tends to be a little less accurate at times. The Sensation also gives you access to only one gig of internal storage space, and the micro SD card slot is occupied with an eight gig card, which limits some of your flexibility out of the box. We're calling this round even at four. Next up is web browsing and multimedia. Web browsing is a push and a pretty similar experience on both phones. The Sensation was a tad faster at pinching and zooming, but in many cases, the G2X was a beat faster when loading pages. The G2X features an 8 megapixel camera with a single flash and a micro HDMI port for video out, while the Sensation brings an 8 megapixel camera with a dual LED flash. Both cameras record and playback 1080p video sources, but we had mixed opinions with the image quality of their pictures. The Sensation 4G also brings the Watch app that allows users to rent or buy movies directly from their phones. But in the end, the Sensation 4G gets a 4.7 and the G2X gets a 4.3. So after averaging four rounds, 
HTC leads by just three tenths of a point. The final round that decides it all is all quality and performance. T-Mobile's G2X was excellent with its clear and crisp sound quality with little to no distortion or static in the background. It was also the snappier performing phone between the two with its dual core Tegra 2 processors and menus that jump instantly from one to another. Now the Sensation 4G sounded excellent as well. The speakerphone wasn't as strong, but regular voice calls were pretty clear. Qualcomm's new dual core processor kept things running smoothly, but maybe the Sensui's animations were a little too taxing, but this phone was still a tiny step behind, and you can feel it. The G2X gets a perfect 5, and HTC gets a 4. So let's average out all the scores, and in a prize fight where HTC's Sensation 4G took an early lead, T-Mobile's G2X stormed back, but it just wasn't enough, and the Sensation takes this battle 4.5 to 4.4, and is your prize fight winner. T-Mobile brings two heavy-hitting contenders that you can't go wrong with, but the final decision, as usual, is up to you. I'm Brian Tong. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you guys next time on another prize fight. So the sensation just barely squeaked by with a win over the G2X, but really, like I said, you can't go wrong no matter which one you choose. Which is more than I can say for the two phones we have coming up in the bad. Okay, so these phones aren't terrible, but with so many choices out there, I wouldn't waste too much time considering either one of them. Well, why don't you guys just see for yourself? I'm Nicole Lee, Senior Associate Editor for CNET.com, and this is a first look at the Samsung Dart for T-Mobile. It is a very basic entry-level Android phone for T-Mobile, and as you can see here, um, it's a very simple silhouette. On the front here is a 3.1-inch display. It's a little bit small by most smartphone standards. On the back here is a 3-megapixel camera lens. The Samsung Dart ships with Android 2.2, but it has Samsung's own TouchWiz interface on it. The TouchWiz interface means that instead of the main menu scrolling up and down like most Android phones, it scrolls side to side in multiple pages. The screen is quite small, as we mentioned before, and the resolution isn't really that sharp either. However, it's quite colorful, as you can see. The Samsung Dart, as we said, is quite basic, but it does ship with a number of basic Android features that includes support for Google Apps and services. It also has a very unique feature courtesy of T-Mobile and that's Wi-Fi calling. That means you can make calls over Wi-Fi. The Samsung Dart is a quad-band 3G GSM phone so it can be used internationally as well. The Samsung Dart is available for free after a new two-year service agreement from T-Mobile. I'm Nicole and this has been a first look at the Samsung Dart. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Dahlcourt for CNET, taking a first look today at the Samsung Trender. This is a new phone for Sprint, but it isn't exactly trendy. Why is that? Because it's got a user interface right here that really takes me back, especially to the days when Samsung was really big into its proprietary user interface, and that's what you've got right here. There are tabs along the bottom and then grids to select the apps and the phone features on this phone. These days we see mostly Android as the operating system of choice for this type of phone. It's not the proprietary software on this phone that bugs me, it's some of the features. There is webmail on this phone, the app is fine, although it's a little bit outdated, but really it's the Twitter and Facebook apps. They're not native, and so you have to reach them from the mobile web, and these days you just have many more better options to do that than this method. There is threaded messaging on here, which is nice. Other tools are driving mode and there are voice commands. The Trender has a 2.8 inch QVGA screen, so it's a nice compact phone. There are hardware buttons below the screen. On the back, there's a 1.3 megapixel camera. I'm not impressed with the photo quality so far. The camera doesn't seem to focus very well. Behind the back cover, there's a micro SD card slot that takes up to 32 gigabytes of external storage. There's also the slide-out QWERTY keyboard. On the keyboard itself, the spacing is good for my hands because it's, it's kind of compact also. The problem, though, was that the keys are pretty flat, so even though they're comfortable, the flatness really slowed me down in typing. Call quality on the Trender, totally acceptable, so there was no real issue there either. 
Right now, the phone costs $29.99 on Sprint's site. It's not a bad phone at all, but there are other budget phones for Sprint that cost the same or less, and you get a lot more, especially if those are Android phones. And some of those are even free on promotion. So I'd say keep your eyes out for that, because there's not really a compelling reason for me to get this phone instead of one of those. I'm Jessica Dahlcourt. This is the Samsung Trender. Read my full review for more details on CNET.com. We don't mean to beat up on Samsung, but trust me, neither of these phones is going to be trending anytime soon. Which brings us to this week's bottom line. Let's wrap up this week's show with one more tablet. Rather than cluttering up the marketplace with another Android device, HP's new touchpad is based on the often overlooked WebOS platform. While that might help HP stand out from the pack, this tablet has some other notable issues to overcome. Hey, I'm Donald Bell, and this is the HP Touchpad. It's a tablet that runs Palm's WebOS and uses a 9.7-inch screen just like the iPad. And the price is the same, with a 16-gigabyte model going for $499 and a 32-gigabyte model going for $599. The hardware itself isn't that impressive. The thick, glossy design feels a little like a slippery imitation of the original iPad, and if finger smudges ick you out, you should know that the back of this thing looks like a crime scene just minutes after you take it out of the box. Also, there's no camera on the back, though you do get one on the front. Personally, I'm fine without it, but it's something that every other tablet offers that's in this price range. Now, there are some hardware tricks that are pretty cool. There's an optional dock that can charge the tablet regardless of how it's placed. HP also sells a Bluetooth keyboard if you prefer typing on something with real keys. And if you have one of HP's phones, like the Pre-3, you can physically touch the devices together and transfer information. It's pretty cool. Really though, it's the software that makes this tablet unique. If you're looking for something beyond the iPad or Android, this is one of the few options out there that really approach the tablet from a different point of view. One of the main differences is the home screen, which is treated like a desktop. Each open task is represented as a stack of cards, which you can rearrange or throw away. What's interesting is that the stacks here aren't specific to each app, they're specific to each task. So you could be reading an email, opening up web links, and those email and web pages are all going to be stacked together as a single task. If you want, though, you can pull aside separate emails or pages by dragging them out of the stack and treating them as a separate task. It's a neat trick, and for some, it's really going to feel like a more natural way to manage your work on a tablet. One other thing that makes the touchpad unique is that it makes a real effort to be compatible with a wide range of services. On the accounts page, you can link the touchpad to everything from Facebook to Skype, Dropbox, AIM, and lots more. Those linked accounts are integrated right into the apps that you'll use them with, so your photo app will pull in your Snapfish account, the messaging app will pull in your Google Talk account, and the calendar will fold together your Facebook and Google events, and it all just works together. So that's a brief look at the HP touchpad. For more details, be sure to read my full review on CNET.com. The bottom line this week, my friends, where is the hand sanitizer? Like, look at those smudges and fingerprints. In Donald's full review, he said the slippery backing felt like a plate at a pizza party. Ugh. It may be called a touchpad, but I won't be doing any such thing. Okay, folks, that's our show. Come back next week for an all-new CNET Tech Review. Until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. See you next week, and thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.